and then they provided comments back to the authors. So this year, the highest scoring abstract goes to Dr. Eleanor Barber. So after completing <laughs> so brief biography of Eleanor, after completing her BA degree from Laude at the University of the Free State, Eleanor successfully, successfully pursued honors and master's degrees in language studies and later on completed a PhD in higher education studies. She has also completed her TEPL assessment and faculty development courses. She has worked as a journalist, academic language and literacy facilitator, research assistant, and, and academic staff developer, and as a lecturer, just to name some of the roles that she has played. Currently, she is the Deputy Director for the Centre for Teaching and Learning on the Park Park campus of the University of the Free State, where she supports 25 academic support staff members to run various projects and programs within the five focus areas, with one of her primary duties to ensure its contextualisation on this rural campus. Through her interactions while attending and facilitating various research, learning and teaching related events, she became curious about good teaching practices and staff and student learning. Her current research interests in the broader sense include learning and teaching interventions and their impact on the academic staff experience and student engagement and success. On a smaller scale, she also studies successfully implementing the scholarship of teaching and learning in communities of practice and supporting academics on a rural campus within a multi-campus institution. So please give a warm round of applause to you all. Innovation and technology, and then in line with the conference theme, 
minds are so curious about what were they saying about the student voice. Um, and of course, all the data will be de identified um, so that yeah, you, you do have your own data and can look at that. Um, just as an addition to how the data analysis took place, I do believe in reading through your data um, because it is the student voice. Um, and um, the quote from James fits for me here. He talks about analytic imagination. To read through the data means drawing, drawing on analytic imagination to see not just what evidence there is, but how one snippet of conversation might relate to another spoken some time later. It means building a picture of the, the lies narrated rather than simply documenting their um, component parts. It involves looking for absences as well as the presences to see what is missing and perhaps explain why. And using this sort of approach, I also realized the importance of keeping the institutional data sets during this secret because some institutions have very dominant themes that are not across all the institutions. And what I was looking for were themes that were across all the institutions. And as soon as I would have combined all that data, I wouldn't be able to see that this is actually one institution with a very contextual um, issue, which I shouldn't combine in this specific analysis. So I'm, that was part of the process. So I identified a few themes. Um, the first one had to do with the registration process and I will definitely not read through all the, the quotes and I tried to pull quotes which I thought might best illustrate the findings. Um, and we, don't, we might not speak about registration a lot when you get to learning and teaching. Um, but if you use the sandwich axiom, it is part of the access in getting into university and the start of sense of belonging, how helpful this university is and makes me feel welcome instead of me struggling to get into this university to just get registered for my modules. And I specifically speak about the online component of registration and how difficult it is to navigate and get advice. Um, students coming from villages, as they call it, to register manually because they struggle so much. Um, mental health support, this did come out in other presentations. Um, what was evident in the mental health um, indicator is that they really mentioned the link to academic pressures and work. It's not just, I'm depressed, I used to be depressed, and I need mental health support. I want the lecturers to understand that it's a lot of work and everything is new and it creates a lot of anxiety, so it's really linked to the pressures of being in the academic environment. Um, financial relief. Um, we sometimes, well, I sometimes heard comments about that the student has missed this funding, we sort it. Um, but even the NISP students talk about the allowances they receive in the on time. Um, which means that you have a student for two months in your class that can't afford food, um, which are other data sets indicate we have students who come to class every day hungry. They talk about free meals, transport, data provisioning, devices, um, textbooks, um, and this really came out very, very strongly in your data. Then, this one was more difficult to see because this respondent spoke quite a lot about the lecture as well. Um, and what we presented at a previous conference is the lecture as well is so important at different levels. As an advisor, as a career advisor, as a motivator. But what specifically came out here is the communication, the effectivity of communication, the sort of information they receive, um, and it's taking the student view into consideration. Tutorial. So when I saw this, I thought, is it peer learning? Um, but the word tutors and tutorials 
just span from the pages. Um, they mention more tutorials, uh, more regular tutorials. Can you pay for tutorials that I can't afford? I want tutorials in all my modules. Um, and they didn't specify necessarily the program that it comes from, but they mentioned the peer learning component of the value of discussion, discussing things with my peers and learning from them. And I think this piece of data just took place in a different context. 2022 was just after COVID when you really started with blended learning. So that might be the reason that the online versus face-to-face -face component came up quite a lot. Um, but some students say, I want more online classes, I want more face-to-face. -face. I only want to study online. I want my assessments to be online, but my classes face-to-face. I want group discussions face to face and everything else online. So everyone has different preferences. Um, but they do have an understanding that there has to be a face to face component um, in order to connect with lecturers. And I'll summarize this as we need to design really good blended learning experiences. And what that would mean. I'm not entirely sure. We know what good benefit learning can look like, but in different modules and programs it might be different. Um, another component that came out very strongly was to the opportunity to apply content. I don't just want to listen to theory. I want an opportunity to apply my knowledge, and I spoke very much about practical experience, um, experience in the real world, experience in the real world and in the communities. Um, and that came across all the institutions. Um, even though, as far as mentioning, I don't feel ready for the world of work. And I'd really appreciate being more exposed to these sort of things. So if we move on to the student voice, um, I'll be honest, I found it very difficult to group these into more smaller things so that it's more digestible in a presentation. Um, but I decided on this grouping. Students definitely have the need to raise their opinions, for their voices to be heard, um, for um, the institutions to listen to them. In some instances they say management must listen to us, lecturers must listen to us, advisors. But what I wanted to emphasize in this specific slide is the top square, um, the sort of emotion that comes out in the way that they phrase this. Um, check in on us, listen to our struggles and our needs and our concerns. Um, the second one, the lecturers again, came out very strongly. We want the lecturers to, to talk to us. And, um, be part of the learning program and the decision making in the teaching and learning. And the last one sort of summarizes all of this. Um, listen to our suggestions before you make big changes. And we want to be in an institution where the institution tries to find a common ground with students and meet them halfway. And this was a quote that I really liked because I don't want you to do everything that I say you must do, but just meet me halfway. Just include my voice somewhere. I know that you are the specialist, but add me to that um, process. So to summarize, what would happen if we listen to our students? What changes would we make now? And I know I'm a bit um, speaking out for everyone based on the data, but just on this specific data, we would have improved registration pro processes, especially considering online registration. We would help our students more in terms of financial support in different areas. There would be more support for our students' mental health, and that's not just our white more psychologists, it's the buildings that are available, the opportunities to discuss this. Lecturers would interact more, more effectively, and include one-on-one -on -one feedback, more interactive tutorials. They didn't just talk about tutorials, but they want the interaction, um, well-designed blended learning experiences, and we would listen even more to our students. Um, for me, this sort of summarizes the student voice. 
Students need to feel that they matter and that they have a voice. For me, this sort of says, when you listen to us, it feels like we matter. But when you listen to us, do it in a way that it seems like we matter to you. So to end off, when do you plan on talking to a student and to ask them how they are doing that? Thank you very much. We've got time for some questions. Any hands going up? If not, I've got a question. So, as a quantitative data person, my way of analysing open-ended questions is to do a word cloud and call it a day. <laughs> and that's exactly what I plan on doing with the conference evaluations that you're obviously completing today. Right. So, what advice do you have to me as a quantitative person to do qualitative better in order to get that student voice into my data? So, I think when you start off with qualitative analyses, um, if you're a quantitative analyst who is using programs and software and, and that sort of thing, so that might be a good way to start. Um, but with qualitative research, you have to put in the time and the effort um, to work through the data. And there's a lot of software that can help with that um, in, at different levels. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know how else to, to answer that. Yes, we've got some questions there, Prof Crouch. Extra tomato, extra 
annually in South Africa, and then from there we had a lot of donations. And then from there maybe we can get some stuff for students to volunteer. Maybe we can get a badge or a certificate for attending or so something to put on the CD. Most of the time students want something, just some kind of recognition, a piece of paper. You know? So I can give you commission. Like also um, with sanitary pads, sanitary health and stuff. When you buy pads, it comes in like 24 or 20. Sometimes you just put two and then every time it's on to buy one, even as stuff, you just to make one. Like those small kind of things are actually just issues. That's why I think it's important for students also have a student voice to to come up come up with innovative ideas. Because then again, like with, um, when students cook and stuff, you waste a lot of food. So like let's say you 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 cooking a, a curry or something, you have pickles, those seeds can now be planted. So as a nurse, you collect those seeds and collect different like vegetable off cuts and stuff. Um, maybe as a university you provide a, a space for the students to plant and grow something on campus. Then from there you have like a almost like a greenhouse kind of thing. And then every time someone comes with no seeds without planting. So you don't actually need to buy seeds. You just give the students the space to actually fix their own problem, so to speak. Because you don't need money. Oh, we need budget, we don't need budget. We just need the students to be able to feel like they matter. Thank you. Thank you Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Great, great presentation. And my question is, is all the CQL grantees have to have a student success committee. And typically that student success committee would have at least a student or two on the committee. Uh, and they have lots of other people. But what do you think are some useful ways to get that student voice? Is it focus groups? Is it surveys? Is it SASE? Is it the committee? Is it uh, large meetings? How do you think our grantees, as they either start up a student success approach or as they renew it, uh, might go forward to get these voices? Thank you so much, Paul. So that's a maybe a difficult question. Um, so we can formalize the student voice, like you mentioned, if we've been in a committee or our programs where, the, where we include the SLC into certain committees um, and so on. But I think. The fact that it's formalized might mean that you miss some of the nuances in the needs and you, you might miss um, your first year students because it's always a senior student included in those formalized events. Um, but it is important, including them in committees and so on. I think the people, in, in a similar way, the people working with the research need to connect with the students in the learning and teaching environment where they, in the manner how they would normally go about their day-to-day -day duties as a student. Um, because that environment would be more comfortable to speak. This isn't a survey, this isn't a focus group interview. It's me talking to you straight and during a learning experience while he's my lecturer and he's asking a question in the class. And it's very anecdotal as a starting point where you connect with those students. But I think it, knowing what the student tells you, but really grasping and getting an understanding of how intense that amount of struggle is. You can only experience that in, in certain areas like the classroom or during an advising session, sitting with a student and helping your advisors once a month for two hours just to get an idea of, of where they are. And although it's anecdotal, it's not 6,000 student voices, um, it just keeps you connected to the environment, which I think we might be missing sometimes if all the research work goes to the research assistants and the data, and although they're fantastic, um, yeah, so definitely the lower and fruit is the S include the SRC because it's part of the duties. We have student representatives in each module, which is uh, uh, very important. Um, in ASEC, it's important for us that the tutor talks to the lecturer, but the tutor also talks to the teaching and learning coordinators. So even as a student um, employee, they're closer to the students to give us that student voice as well. Just here, so. Thank you. The two more questions, just one from Susan and one from Wendy. Hi, uh, 
I'm really excited about this research. I, it so strongly aligns with what we know as evidence-based practices in the classroom, for example. So looking at the purple dot, right? We would provide well-designed blended learning experiences. So what the students are saying to you and what you're uncovering absolutely aligns with what we know pedagogically works well in the classroom, which is centering the student. And I just want to echo the students' comment about the, the garden, right? You know, it doesn't have to cost more money to change our practices in the classroom. Obviously, professional development training is needed, but it's really a cultural shift to me, right? Even if you have a thousand students, there are pedagogical strategies to break them into groups and to have them decide why is this content relevant and meaningful to me, and how can I apply this assignment to a real world application in my own life? To me, all that means is asking them that question, reframing the assignment in such a way that the students do it themselves. And I, I often love to use the word, the community is the curriculum, right? And we're, we're really trying to move from the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. That doesn't cost any money. That's just simply a, 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 a cultural shift, right? But where it also can land is leadership the presidents, the vice chancellors coming down and giving permission to shift that focus in the classroom. So one of the things I would, I would encourage and I love is taking each one of these verticals that you have and painting a picture of exactly what it could look like, right? And that's gonna sort of inspire like, the how is where we get to see it. Um, so that's, I guess, one of my questions to you or just my encouragement, right, of, of trifurcating this data to then the application of the how. Because having it come from the students is very powerful for leadership and faculty to hear, um, to motivate them and to nourish them, really, to say, if I do this, students are going to learn and have a better experience. And so am I in the classroom. Right? So I just want to thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. And then Wendy and friends, and that's the last question. Thank you very much. Let's go to the end of the